On this episode of the Real Life Caddy Podcast, I'm joined by one of my oldest friends, pro caddy Mark Crane. I've known Craney for pretty much my whole life, and we've done a fair amount of caddying together. Craney's been working for the pros for over 15 years, and it's allowed him to travel the world via the European Tour, the Asian Tour, and now the PGA Tour. Not only has he caddied for winners, he's also worked at two Walker Cups, two Ryder Cups, and dozens of majors. This episode was recorded a few months ago when he was in town visiting. He now works for Sweden's Alex Norren, and I'm very happy to say that he's still in the bag. Mark's journey from club caddying in Scotland to Ryder Cup success in Paris is a fascinating listen. His knowledge of the game even shocked me, and I'm sure you'll enjoy his story. The Real Life Caddy Podcast is sponsored by Big Game Golf, the number one golf scoring and networking app. The app has every golfer's favourite game, and doesn't just take the hassle out of scoring, but adds pinpoint accuracy to the end result. Download the app today and join the fastest growing golf app network out there. We really appreciate the support, and we also appreciate you listeners. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to another episode of the Real Life Carry Podcast. This one's called Presswick Boy dot 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 got lucky. I don't know what number it is. This is kind of getting done on the cuff uh, because my wee pal for Ayrshire, Mark Crane, is with me. Marky, welcome. How are we doing, Gordon? Pleasure to be here. It's three. three. It's not on the cuff. It's off the cuff. Off the cuff. Yeah. It already starts. Let's try and keep this civil, just for the. I'm just just pointing in the right direction. Keep, you know, as as always. Keep the per- personal banter out of this. I'll try and be professional if you can. I know I you can't be. You can't be. I'll just be me. There's no point in me something you're not. Exactly. So, uh, for those that you don't know, Presswick is where. The Open Championships first started, the first 12, that was the birthplace of the Open, the first 12 Opens were there, so it's all started there, so it did, it's a very historic uh, golf course, probably because of that there, I'd say, you know, it's got a lot of history, but for me, Presswick Golf Club is more than a golf club, uh, it's a place I grew up, learning my trade, um, meeting, trade. Some, meeting some amazing people, uh, there's some great caddies there, who could have easily went down the path I went down on, and as I said, I got lucky. Uh, but it's got a big place in my heart and always will have uh, and some amazing members some amazing staff uh, just a great place if I was going to be a member of any golf club in the world it would be there I wouldn't get in but it would be the choice if I could get in <laughs> but uh, I'm lucky enough I can get to play it from time to time uh-huh. uh, which I do do really appreciate so just so the listeners know Mark uh, actually carries on tour who are you currently carrying for? I'm currently working for Alex Norrin uh, who you might well know if not he's, uh, he's a player who's played in Europe for quite a few years and played in the PGA Tour uh, he's probably well known. Uh, quite Sweden. established name. He's from Stockholm, Sweden. He played in the 2018 Ryder Cup uh, on the winning team. Just get that so you Yanks know that it was a winning team. Uh, <laughs> so you know, I think it was Americans' best team all time on paper. But that means nothing, obviously. So yeah, that's who I'm working for just now. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Uh, I did take a break from caddying there, so I was off for about 16 months. Um, Due to pandemic, due to a few other things, but Aye. yeah, the, 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 juices, the juices are flowing again. It's great to be back on tour. Aye, you like the Swedes, don't you? Because the last time you were out here in California, you were carrying the US Open. I like any golfer who lines my pocket. To be honest, it doesn't matter what country they're from, <laughs> if I'm being honest. But yeah, the last golfer was full time golfer was a guy called Marcus Kinholt, who super super nice guy. Um, had a good run with Marcus. Uh, the end of when it ended, it was not not. To do anything to do with Marcus, it was just where I was at, and I could the pandemic was coming, and I kind of wanted a break from carrying for being on tour for say fifteen years or something like that, or right. fourteen years, and it was probably it was the right time, and I didn't really actually want to let Marcus down by letting him down was it was easier to walk away because I felt like if I stayed with him, it would have been it could have hindered him, which wasn't fair on him, you know, so he didn't deserve that. So yep, that was another Swede. Okay, but I have worked for Alex in the past from time to time as well, so there's a bit of a Swedish connection there. Aye, and you just finished second at the Dunhill? The Dunhill? Uh, well, I didn't finish second. I got the check for the second, which is all I care about, to be honest, but I'm only joking. No, uh, yeah, Alex finished second at the Dunhill. That was our second tournament together. We'd worked two weeks prior to that uh, in Napa Valley. I think we finished uh, around about mid-30s, uh, which was steady first week. You know, I think Alex had three weeks off before that, so that was the start of the new season on the PGA Tour. Went back to play the Dunhill, um, which Alex has always likes to play. He's quite, you know likes of Dunhill he's, he's got a partner he plays with he always kind of plays with him every year so he feels kind of loyal to do that and obviously 
being back in Europe in a Ryder Cup year, you're going to get some points on the board. So finishing second was, was good. And Aye. it was, for me, got my juices flowing and I felt more comfortable on the golf course than I've ever had for a long time. So it's it's definitely something where I know I belong. And Aye. that's uh, on the bag. I've got a million other ideas, but to be fair, Aye, I'm most only good at caddying and the rest of them I'm not very good at. Aye, the other ideas are shite. Yeah, I, w- I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word uh, S-H-I-T. I would say... Uh, <laughs> maybe, with an E as well. Yes, it's, oh, that's right. Uh, that's shit. Sorry, but never mind. Uh, I wouldn't say they were shit. They're maybe a little bit, you know, far fetched, and maybe I just concentrate on what you're good at because that's what I've done well from, and I'll just stick to that road now. Going on. Now, we've known each other basically all our lives, haven't we? Unfortunately, and, yeah. And you unfortunately, have. Yeah. and your memory's a lot better than mine, uh, which is maybe a good thing for me, man, because I probably wouldn't want to remember half the stuff that we've done because there's only a f- I could probably count my hand of the good stuff we've done. So <laughs> that that shows you, of, you know, that's a good thing. But he can remember everything. This guy's got the best memory in the world. Gordon, I don't know Gordon Rorson, obviously you do, but his memory is incredible. Um, I do. Yeah, so it doesn't really do me any favors because. There's a lot of stuff that's probably not been good, and he knows, and he loves to bring it back up. So, unfortunately. <laughs> do you know it's it's almost like a two double edged sword because I wouldn't mind one sometimes. It makes getting older tough because I can remember things like they were yesterday, but it turns out oh, it was twenty five years ago. That's and true. I, yeah, I, you do. I, like, I we had a great. We were out for a lovely dinner last night, and we came up with a story um, where we both kind of went on this mad journey and kind of kind of where we both kind of started and obviously we went well, different paths but it's still related to caddying and I won't go too deep on it but it was a great story and, and there was another person involved called Fall Down Phil from Royal Troon and to this day I would never imagine that this guy couldn't get a bag or he couldn't we went there with no bags well I had a bag that Gordon and Phil didn't have a bag then Gordon got a bag quite quick which was good so we're two out of the three have got bags Phil's panicking gets a bag and ends up the guy who wins the tournament so and that was history. So, but it was just amazing to think that Phil had the courage to come from Troon. Right. You know what I mean? And, it, and a lot of the guys in the carry shack were putting, "Oh, you'll never do it. You'll never make it." And he, right. Phil, to be fair to him, you know, he had a bit of a pass with think with drink, uh, and he's given that up, which is fair credit to him. He was really good, good at it. Very good caddy. He was, he was a better drinker than he was a caddy. <laughs> but um, but he gave up probably his best asset. But that's fine. <laughs> it was it, it was for the best. But you know what? I still think of Phil sometimes, and we had a great laugh with him last night. And I remember. You couldn't have written the story, and it was, it was, it, was, it, was it was like he'd won the lottery. We were so proud of him, um, and it was more the satisfaction that you could see that it got to people back home that they were putting him down mm-hmm. and negative and didn't think that, that he could do that, and he did. He's won a European tour event as a caddy, and not a lot of folk can say that, mm-hmm. uh, and I think he's only maybe carried in a few. So, so I take my hat off to Phil for that, and it was a memory I'll never forget, and it just shows you if you want it and you reach for the stars, there's a possibility you can go get it. Uh-huh. I mean, there's a prime example. Uh-huh. Um, and there's a lot of people who are negative and, and, and say you'll never do it or never do it. These people, these people don't have it in them to go get it. That's why they say that. So it's easy way out. So you don't ever let those people get in your way or knock you down. Okay. Phil, he came out of his comfort zone because I remember that his, his wife comfort Mary... Comfort zone, of course. The minute he put, a, the, minute he put the, the vodka down, he came out of his comfort zone. <laughs> True. But Mary did everything for him, his wife, because he, oh. he didn't know how to cook a, a pork chop. But then when he gets sunburned... He didn't know what a pork chop looked like. When he gets he's, he's sunburned in his legs, he had third degree burns in his legs. I remember that you were very kind to him by telling him to shut up yes. when it he was, was complaining. Well, we, but we did tell him to put some cream on. It's warm here. It's a different climate from back home. No, no, no I, I can what I'm doing. I can. Don't worry about me. Out there with no hat on. Uh-huh. He's quite pale. He comes in like a lobster. And then... We and Gordon are trying to educate him, well, maybe not me so much. I didn't give him any sympathy, but I'm kind of like that, a bit ruthless. Gordon's a bit more caring and kind hearted sometimes. Um, so he was like, You need to get after son, you need to, you know, you need to, you need to really, this, you know, this is, this could go further. Like, you know, we're talking the C word, can you never, you've got to be very careful of things. Um, so God, he decides that Phil thinks that if he goes and gets some cooking oil, that'll bring it, cam, cam it all down. No, I think you'll find maybe aloe vera, you know, it's after it's sun. Yeah. After I don't sun. know where he's getting the two of them on the same path, but... Going to a French a French uh, supermarket and he brings back olive oil. I says, listen, olive oil in French is the same as it is in English, pal. Yeah. You and need to put that down and grab some after sun. And the thing with the olive oil, at least it came in handy for the pork chops. <laughs> True. <laughs> didn't, know, didn't know how to cook a pork chop, but aye, that was a good story. Now, take us back to the start because you didn't, Grow up playing golf, did you? No, I didn't grow up playing golf. Uh, football was my thing when I was younger. Golf was fun, something my, my father and my brother had a connection with. My brother um, was reasonably good at younger. Uh, he got a job as uh, working at the weekends in, at Old Presswick uh, for the pro there, who's a legend, Mr. Frank Rennie. And he made he worked here at the weekends, got him into golf, etc., etc. And I remember thinking that golf 
I was asked to go to the golf, thinking about going to golf, and I was like, nah, it's not for me, it's not for me, you know, it's Saturday, I play football on a Saturday, blah, blah, blah. But it didn't really, it really all kind of, you know, took place in 1997, when the Open was at Royal Troon, through the connections from my brother and Mr. Rennie at Old Presswick, uh, they had an American friend called Hank Freed, who's still alive, and he's a great guy, he was he worked on tour for Golf Pride, he's a rep, very close to the golfers, the caddies, etc, etc, so we had a connection there. Uh, there was a caddy in the name of Bob Reifke, um, who was looking for a place to stay during the 1997 Open Championship at Royal Troon, and he'd obviously spoke to Hank, and Hank had said, you know what, I've got a family who live there, I can be asked them. Just so they know, Presswick and Troon butt up against each other, don't they? They, they do, They're yes, right yeah, next yeah, to each yeah, other. Yeah, so. but, just, but just don't forget, they're two different golf clubs, are you okay? Two very different golf clubs. One's an Open Championship course, which is very good demanding golf course, but it's not a patch on Presswick Golf Club. Okay. Just so we'll get that in there, okay? Right. But I do like, well, no offence if you're a Royal Troon member, but you know, but Press- they, they know that anyway. If, if the Open's at Troon, Presswick's a great place for someone to stay. Hundred percent. And your it's, family it, lived in Presswick. Yeah, so. we lived three miles from the four, three to three and a half miles from the first tee, maybe less if that makes sense. So it was it was a convenient town to live in for a caddy. So he was struggling for accommodation. Hank had made a call. Of course, of course. And I wasn't bothered. I was like, some of these caddies coming to stay. I was like, right, okay. My dad and that are quite bu- buzzing, and my brother's probably buzzing and that. I was thinking, okay. Then I kind of went, we got free tickets, obviously, we started going to the golf. And funnily enough, he carried for Justin Leonard, who went on to win the Open that week, mm-hmm. uh, become the Open champion, which is obviously amazing. And the Sunday night, Bob included us. We got to meet Justin throughout the week. I still speak to Justin these days on tour when I see him from time to time. Bob, I don't really keep in touch anymore. I think he's had difficulties at some point, maybe along the ways. Um, but if he's out there and he's listening and he knows him, tell him I was asking for him. Mark Crane's asking for him. You remember where he's from? I can't. I'm quite bad with memory, you know that. Because uh, Leonard's from Texas, isn't Leonard's he? Leonard's a Texas boy, yes. I think he might be from Texas, but I'm not too sure about whereabouts. But it was brilliant. They really included us. Uh, my brother was buzzing. I got a feel for golf that week. Um, I remember on the 17th we, I remember coming out of the Marine Hotel at Troon with Justin Leonard at the time and he must have been really friendly with Corey Paven because Corey Paven was there uh, myself, my brother, maybe an agent and I remember we were coming out the front door and Tom Watson was there and you know Tom Watson's a legend and he was a legend on the whiskey that night because he had maybe a few <laughs> too many but you know what, he was a nothing gentleman but we went out to the 17th hole late at night it was pitch dark you could only really see the lights from the marines shining down towards it to try and give you a vague idea how to get there and he, just roughly from where Justin had held this putt in 17 across you maybe a 35 44 pretty much when you look back was a winning putt because I think Parnovic bogeyed 17 a couple of groups behind him um, and it was a two shot swing and we sat there and kind of reminisced it and um, we got pizzas come out for us it was amazing you know mm-hmm. you, how could you write that but really what got me was I think these guys, these guys can make some cash, eh? <laughs> uh, so I was thinking to myself, this is great. Then not long after that, I thought I could try and get into Caddy. And I think there's an opportunity to carry for a, a member at Presswick in an afternoon or Saturday. And it was like the, the, the older guys at Presswick, you know, it was more of a social thing. They, they, they would be, you know, they're getting on in life. So they would play in the afternoon. They'd go for a lunch, maybe have a few drams and then maybe, you know, clear the head and maybe go out and play a week in a cross country, maybe six or seven, eight holes. You could dish dash across the course, which was brilliant, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Keep yourself, they always kept themselves close to the clubhouse. And I think it was £25 at that time or twenty twenty five pounds for like two hours work. Right. At that current point, I was getting 12 quid. I was going every day for a paper round, mm-hmm. getting piss wet through. Mm-hmm. I thought to myself, double the dough, right. plus a pound, one day a week. <laughs> Football's we moved to a Sunday. This Perfect. is good. This is good. Then I was hooked from there. Uh-huh. But the minute I got hooked and I got, I liked the money and, and I liked that, I nearly paid him a little bit, right, club caddy, where can it take you? What's the opportunity here? Like, can I can I provide for a family doing this, or or, or is, this, is this where I want to see my career, or or do I have ambition to get higher? And then an opportunity to came to go and carry a golf club in America in a place called Beaufort Secession. Mm-hmm. Uh, the pro there was quite friendly with the pro at Presswick, and he invited me over in the off season at Presswick. So our season at Presswick probably run kind of May to September with the busy months, and their off their season was busy kind of from kind of October to mid December, and then back out mid January to kind of mid. Mid March, end of end of March, um, which worked out great. So you could carry for say ten months of the year right. uh, consistently, and you're a young guy. So I went out there, and that was like another step because I'm getting the best of both worlds. I'm getting to travel. I'm getting to base myself in America. I would like to say I became a bit of a man by that by doing that, moving away from home. Um, my, my, people might differ, 
Uh, but you grew up, you know what I mean? My mum, Irene, you know, she's not there to do my washing anymore. She's not there to make my breakfast, make my bed. So I had to, I had to fend for myself for a bit. <laughs> but then again, I did, I did use other people to help me along the way. But yeah, from there. So yeah, Wait, that was when did you start playing golf? Because you wouldn't have started playing till 16. I probably didn't start playing, but I think I'd been to the range a few times. I quite liked it, but I was never really into it. But yeah, I would say around about 15, 16, I started to get right into it. Aye. I've got a bit of an you know, addictive personality. So when I get into something, it was good. And obviously, my football, I wasn't the best football in the world, and you're never going to make anything out of that. But I enjoyed the football, but I knew it was. I knew it was my heart had went, went elsewhere. You know, my, my passion was on this side of the track now to the golf. So you any good at golf? Well, you need to, you can answer that. I played against you the other day. We played at Del Monte um, Golf Club the other day there, and um, I have a higher set. Don't know the course, um, and I won the money. So I was good enough on that day. That's all. My, I'm a free. I'm a free to four handicapper probably right. in the UK. I would say I'm I'm decent. Uh-huh. I'm decent. But where do you think your your big break came with the caddying then? To go to the opposite direction. My, my big break came from Presswick. It right. came at Presswick when Home Internationals came. Stan Craig, the carry master at the time, God bless him, was uh, was always really nice to me and, and, and was good. Um, and he, I think he's seen a bit of ambition in me. The Home Internationals came there. Uh, so what's the Home International? Home Internationals was an amateur event between the four nations, between Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England at the time. Scotland finished fourth, no doubt. No, they didn't. They finished second. All right, OK. And it was Wales who, I think, had a chance to beat England. And they should have done it for Scotland to win the way it worked, but it didn't. So to cut a long story short, there was a couple of very good amateurs at the time for Scotland at the time who probably all played tour events or been on tour at some point, pretty much. I'd say four out of six have done well. And there was a name, a boy called Lloyd Saltman. 2004, I'm pretty sure, because he played the Open 2005 the following year. Around about 2004, and his father had seen the potential in his son and he kind of was looking for a kind of... Didn't really want looking for a caddy on the amateur circuit, if that makes sense. But right. so he obviously his father was like, This was a big stage. Lloyd got into this team kind of a wee bit younger than the rest of the players because of his potential. And obviously, they were getting caddies paid for by the SGU, so this is how it worked. So we had a good paddy, caddy program. So every player had a caddy in all the nations. And did they play what was it, foursomes and foursomes match? But like, I can't exactly remember the exact cir- circuit, but it was a lot of golf and it was right. brilliant. And the weather was amazing. I remember. I remember one day we had the brawly out to hide the sun. It was like uh-huh. to get away. It was so hot. But Jack Saltman, uh, Lloyd's father, he'd asked Stan for a caddy, maybe some young guy in courage who's good. And Stan had just told me that I was going to be caddying for this boy, Lloyd Saltman. So I kind of looked him up. I thought, he's had some good results. So I was looking forward to it. And the minute we met, it clicked, me and Lloyd. Uh-huh. You couldn't meet a nicer fella. Lovely, lovely guy. As genuine as it comes. Got great belief. He was a super talent at the time. Same age as you? Uh, no, Lloyd's a few years younger than me. Lloyd will be probably 35, 36. Yeah, he's, uh, he's always about 36. So he was about 17 at the time, eh? Yeah, 17, 18, yeah, that's right, yeah. And then we did really well there, we got on, and then there was a few other big amateur events after that that year, so I went to carry for them. You're not making any money at these amateur events, you know, you're getting your expenses paid, and you're actually losing money, because you could be at home club making money, but i seen it as a way in, you know what I mean? I thought, uh-huh. this guy, this boy had all Because he was. If anyone doesn't know who Lloyd was, this boy was an absolute world beater at the time, he had this, he? Yeah, he had the superstar pedigree, he did. And things, unfortunately, didn't go his way, and, but you never know, but uh, he had all the talent, yes, and for whatever reason, it hasn't worked, but... The guy hasn't changed, and he's one of my best friends, even though we don't see each other as much as we like to, but we've always got a massive bond. Him and Rory together, if you know who Rory is, Rory Macro is not bad at golf. Right. Um, they were both kind of on the amateur circuit at the same time, and um, they were both exceptional. I think even they would both say, I think Rory would be quite happy to turn around and say that, we were, that, Rory, Rory, that he would have thought that Lloyd would have been on tour with him, you know, we'd yeah. maybe me and be a Ryder Cup partner at some point together at, uh-huh. at that time, but obviously you never know, but I'm sure he was very... He, a lot of credit for him so we did the amateur events Lloyd qualified at Scotch Craig Golf Club quite easily uh, when it used to be Monday qualifying before the Open in 2005 and the Open was at St Andrews so here we are we qualified for the Open at St Andrews my big Lloyd's big stud you know, big big tall good looking guy he's sponsored by like Jay, me? Jay Linden no no I said good looking tall slim right. like you're, you're the opposite you know what I mean good looking uh, aye, aye good looking aye aye, aye okay I'll crack your jokes right he qualifies in 2005 so he's good looking big guys get you know Jay Lindenberg golfs right into him you know and we're getting all this free gear and oh life's great and you're thinking, yeah, the open, whatever happens, just take day by day. All of a St. sudden, Andrew, St. Andrews, it's St. Andrews, yep, St. Andrews. Jack Nicholas's farewell. Aye, aye, that's aye. when they, I don't know if we were in the UK, they made a five pound note based on that's the Jack right. Nicholas. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I got a few of them, hide away. So if anyone wants to buy one, make me an offer. <laughs> uh, so that was that. Fi- I'll give you a fiver. Uh, I'll crack jokes. That was that. But all of a sudden, you know, Lloyd's made, he, he's made the cut as an amateur. So as an amateur, you want to try and make the cut, obviously, or as in general, but it's a big it's a big achievement and it's big for his career. It gets him more recognised, etc. globally. It makes the cut quite comfortably. 
Uh, there's another amateur from Mexico, Eric Ramsey from Canusta, who was part of the, the team as well when we played down at uh, Press Week for the Home International. So they're both, then they're both nearly, they were the only two amateurs that made the cup. So two Scottish boys, as amateurs, make the cup. So they're both trying to fight out to be the best amateur, which is quite prestigious. And I'm sure Eric finished 25th. So Lloyd birdied the last, I think, to move into the bracket. I think he was tied roughly with Eric until the last hole, and Lloyd made a birdie on the last at 18 to finish tied 15 for 17. I think it was 17th to win the silver medal. And, uh-huh. uh, Top that, amateur. Yeah. And Tiger won the Open that year. Yeah. Jose Maria and Ty, Colin Montgomery were tied second. second. So there was it was the, the the ceremony was you know silver medal winner Lloyd Saltman. Uh, congratulations on the tie, the runner up uh, was was Colin Montgomery and Jose Maria tied and then obviously the champion was Tiger Woods the the revolution of the game. So it was a moment you'll never forget. Uh huh. That were, was that was there, that right? was the buzz you know. Were you on eighteen when they were presenting? Yeah, I was on eighteen. Yeah, just like in, in front of the RNA house. Yeah, I was there. But I remember Lloyd had hit his tee shot. Kind of, you kind of aim for like just right edge of the right RNA clubhouse, maybe on the clock, because the kind of middle ground on the ta- the angle. Uh, it's not even though it's the biggest fairway probably in the world, it it still makes you hit it. You know, you can still right. see that up your right hand side if that makes sense. You know, so you, you kind of hit it up the left, and it kind of kind of because it was so firm, it kind of pulled away. And the pin was front left. You know, it, it's a terrible pin. You know, down that valley there, and we kind of stepped it together to try and get a yardage. And we're walking back, and what do you think? And I just said to him, I, I didn't even think it just came out. I said, you have to put this. Because the fairways were baked, you have to put this. Man, he rolled this putt up, goes down the valley, and you're just your heart's in your mouth because it can go. If it doesn't, you don't hit it hard enough, it's back down, and then you're really uh, it rolled up. Then you're thinking this could go in. The mm-hmm. crowd are going mad. Just brushes past, leaves himself a nice maybe three, two and a half, sneaky two and a half, three footer down the hill for birdie. But what a feeling, you know. I think Lloyd will probably say that feeling was the best feeling he ever had as a golfer so far because. It was the crowd was there. It was a packed day. You're at home crowd. You know it, it, you couldn't write it. I was the hairs say. in the back of your neck stand up. You know, and and the, the most annoying thing about a point like that is it goes in in a flash. Aye. But if you could wrap it up and 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 have it, you know, and, and feel it more often, it would be amazing. But Aye. it was amazing. So you you were born in '82, like I was. So I'm sure my mum tells me you're 23. Mm-hmm. 23. 23. Yeah. Walking down 18. That must have been incredible, buzz. Inc- were you nervous? Was, nervous, or are you too young to bother about nerves? I was nervous, but excited. I think nervous, is, ner- being nervous is good. Being having nerves is good, but I think you've got to nearly enjoy it. If that aye, makes sense, if aye. you let the nerves take over, it can affect you. So we're, we're excited as an amateur. It was like you had really nothing to lose, like to a certain extent. And I think that's the way you should play the game anyway. I think that's why some of the greats have, have done hardly greats because that's how they see it, and that taught me a lot. But yeah, that made me think, oh, I want to be a carry on tour. But things from there, there was a point after that. I thought carrying, my carrying career on tour was over. Uh-huh. So it was. I remember getting the call from Richie Ramsey to one. He got his tour card off the Challenge Tour. And so what happens to Lloyd Saltman then? He, that was a highlight of his career, huh? Lloyd Saltman um, went to there, went and played the Walker Cup in County Down. Uh, they lost. Maybe should have turned pro quicker. I think Gordon Dre, I think we touched on I thought he turned pro that year. I think he didn't turn pro until 2008, no. actually, because he played two Walker Cups. But I think it was 07 or 08. Richie Ramsey decided to turn pro or went to the challenge tour or the tour school. I think he went to tour school as an amateur. Didn't make he, he didn't make it on. He didn't get his card, but he got challenge tour status. Aye. So for the, the Americans, Richie Ramsey, he's another Scottish golfer. He was on the team. Yep. And he won the US amateur. First he won the US amateur. Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Yeah. Um, and I had a bond with Richie because him and Lloyd used to play together uh-huh. through the Scotland stuff. Uh, both different players. Richie was as solid as you like. You know. You know. He was precise. You know. He knew his game. He stuck to his game. Lloyd had a bit more. Flip they are a bit more natural talent. They were a great combination. I don't think they'd ever got beat together. They were phenomenal. So Lloyd's career, kind of, he stayed amateur for longer, got some invites, things didn't really work. So Richie went to tour school as an amateur in 2007, it would have been. Didn't get his card, but got stats to play on the Challenge Tour 2008, I think it was. Mm-hmm. It was a, and he decided to turn pro instead of playing, instead of staying as a Walker Cup, where Lloyd did. So Lloyd Richie got his card off Challenge Tour, or the first year on tour. So 2008, Nine season, which would have been 08 09 season, that was my first main break. Um, so Richie played some events, uh, end of 08, start of the new season. And I remember it coming to kind of this time of year, right about right now, not long ago, it was about yeah, in 2009. Richie didn't really do much that well. We'd missed three cuts in a row. My, my first three events for Richie on the 2009 calendar year, we missed three cuts in a row. And I'm starting to doubt myself, I think myself, is this me or is that him? But we both battled through it. I think he, he, he believed in me and I believed in him. Like somebody could have turned around and said, I'll take more experience. But I think we both knew we, we had a good, a good we, we, could, we could do it together. But it was coming to like three or four events from the end. I think it might have been three events. I think we had the Dunhill. 
Portugal, maybe one or Spain then Portugal. What we had three events. There was a couple of events after that, but Richie's category wasn't getting into it. We needed to make like I think fifty thousand euros at the time between the three events to keep our card. I think we finished I think Richie finishes third or tied tied third at the Dunhill. Round about third or four I think he was four for his own or tied third, whatever it may have been. Made over a hundred thousand. That was him. Cards thrown up. So all of a sudden we went from thinking, I'm thinking myself. I'm not a tour caddy. Mm-hmm. Richie's going to maybe, we're not, unfortunately, might not keep her card, even though we had two more chances after that. But this was a big event. So if you didn't do well that week, a lot of people would have uh, overtaken you. Uh-huh. So that happened. The 2009 10 season starts. We go down to South Africa to Pearl Valley. First tournament on the calendar. Boom, we win it. So all of a sudden, in a six week period, we went from, I'm thinking I can't be on tour. I'm not, this is not for me. To the excitement of keeping your card. And then all of a sudden, you're a winner. You've got a winner's category. You get another different tournament, and we never look back from there. How many times did you win with him? We won twice with Richie. We twice. won there, which was the, the best win of my life because it meant so much to me and it meant so much to Richie. And it was in a playoff against Shiv Kapoor. Uh, I remember on the 18th, Richie just played played solid. And then a couple of years later, we this win was a, a better win as in the level of the win. Uh, Richie won it in Switzerland at a place called Crans Sancerre. Uh, we're in the last group with Paul Laurie, which is obviously, he's from Aberdeen and so is Richie. Open champion, prolific winner, and we come out with Danny Willett's playing with us as well, who'd won, who'd a lot of ability and who's a rising star, and yeah, and, and wire to wire, I think they boys both buried the first and we didn't, and I think we were one behind already, and we just kept at it, we just kept playing our game, we just kept patient. Richie was brilliant at that; he would never get out of his comfort zone. He knew his game if it just keep you know ticking away, shot by shot, just fairways and greens, fairways and greens. It was as simple as that for Richie. The, the putts will drop, the putts will drop. Well, on the thirteenth hole. Uh, the wedge dropped. We made an eagle. That was the turning point. Richie ended up cruising it in from there. I was a big. That was a big win. How long did you stay with him? I worked for Richie for probably about four years. Four years, same player. Did you ever Three get? Three and a half, four years. Do you guys get pissed off with each other? Is it? Oh, Richie can. Richie's. Richie's. All these. Don't get me wrong. All these golfers have got their things. So it's like everybody. But you spend that much of time with them, the little things start to annoy you. Yeah. Like Richie, and me used to step. So we're both going to a yellow dot, for example. I would get 10 on to it, he'd get 11. Or I'd get 9 on it, he'd get 10. We'd never get the same. I think we'd say, what's the point of two of a step? Why don't you just step it? Because if I say 9, he'll say 8. So you, uh-huh. you, these little things like that. But they what? don't mean But you, you, Yeah. But what if he hit... Utmost respect for Richie uh, Ramsey. If, if he hit a 7 iron, how far did he hit a 7? Back in the day, when I was kind for Richie, I would say, when you're looking, what, 5th, 14, 14 years ago, I would say Richie would probably have been about 1... 67 I think I remember right. 155 8 iron. he wasn't overly long things have changed now right. he's developed as well what was his parameters then would it be like plus 5 minus 5 if he steps on it or takes a little off uh, Richie aye, it would be like yeah you would, you'd be looking at 5 to 7 gaps there yeah aye. yeah. Uh-huh. if you had it yeah, exactly. talking about stuff like that there is that this you know, I'm just going to take a little bit off it um, this, uh, I've worked for Terrell Hatton and he was probably the best I've ever seen it taking the yardage off club he would take club he would have his normal grip where, where the hand sit where he's just hitting normal then he'd have two more sit positions on the grip one between that and the end of the grip and then another one right at the end of the grip and he would be able to take five or seven off that way so he'd three numbers for every club Aye. or he could step on one two from a full which was the easiest way to do it he'd still hit a full swing just stand a little bit closer to the ball the further you go uh-huh. down it and it's so much easier you think about it you're, you're doing it at address you're just hitting the same and, and that was amazing where some guys will just try and cut it or that and it was hard to cut it and take it all with the ball now the ball doesn't move as much I think that's like what for any amateur out there or any even pro that's maybe you know just started just get one of those track man's those quad pros and dial those numbers in by doing the grips it's so easy you don't have to decel or through the ball or, or try and hit it a little bit softer uh-huh. just do it at up address and down, up and down the grip up and down that's the it. grip exactly it's so simple uh, and it made my life simple. Um, Did he ever get close to Ryder Cup? Richie, no, he never got close to Ryder Cup. I'm pretty sure we sneaked in the top 50 in the world at one point or round about it. Did you go, did you I go remember Masters? we finished that year when he won in 2009, it started 2010 when he won South Africa. We got into the HSBC Champions that year. And at that time, that was like a, it's a World Golf Championship at the time. So it's just oh. outside a major. Did we finish second or did we finish third on our own? I can't remember, but I can remember it was a big check. Aye. Um, and to be honest, that was massive. Like could, The field that Richie was in at that time, not being on tour long, I think Richie, it might have been Richie, one of Richie's biggest checks as a mm-hmm. golfer. But yeah. I think it gave him belief. We did some USPGAs together, top 100 in the world. Um, Richie's had a lovely career, you know what I mean? But yeah. I'll tell you something, He's every every euro that that boy has earned, he's worked for it. Nice. He's not been given it. His work ethic's tremendous, and there's a lot of people who could learn a lot from Richie. Do you know? But you, he's tight. Do you? All right, he's tight. 
He really is. At least for but Aberdeen, isn't he? Yes, sir. And he is. He says he's careful. I said, Richard, yeah. no, that's maybe what you think. Yeah. I said, you're tight. But he's, he's got a great heart. Yeah. If you phoned him up tomorrow and said, Richard, I'm struggling, he would definitely help me. I know that for sure. Yeah, but and his heart's not going to put food on the table, is it? No, he's got a big heart. I'll give him that under yeah. pressure. Still and not going to put food on the table. No, exactly. So yeah. he, needs to, he needs to dip into that account that he's got. No, he's got a lot of O's <laughs> in the end of it. Do you go from him to, like, how does it go? Does, when you finish up with him, does he sack you? Do you just I sack just, him? I just, I think I, I knew that my time was up with Richie. I didn't really know how to tell him. And I'm sure I told him in Holland on a Tuesday. I did not want to do it after the tournament because I thought to myself, I've got this in my mind all the week. I didn't know what to do, didn't know what to do. I thought, to tell him on a Tuesday, I upset him. It worked out for the best. Because I said to him, and I think Richie was a bit shocked, and I was, it was very hard for me to tell him. But we had a good week, and we just said, you know what, this is going to be our last week together, and we went out on a high mm-hmm. together. We both said, you know what, let's win this week, let's try our best, let's have the best week, you know, let's go on a high, and we did. And... It gave him. I think he actually then gave him time for a few to, to calculate it. I know it was mid tournament, but it was. I think it was better than telling him on a month. Let's say you told Mister Cut and you tell him then. It was. I don't know if I could have done it. Another told kick, him another kick in the nuts. Yeah, exactly. And it actually worked out that one of my other friends, Ryan McGuigan from uh, from uh, Northern Ireland, uh, a good friend of mine, great guy. Northern Ireland. Yeah, he is. He's from the. He's from God's country, as they say, where my father's from. Actually, my dad's a Carrick Fergus boy. Uh, so. Ryan was, I think, looking for a bag or just his, he was in a similar situation and they they towed up, like, let's say, a couple of weeks after. So it worked well. Then they had a good run together. They won together in Morocco. So looking back, I did the right thing, um, as hard as it was. Um, but, yeah, I've not worked for Richie since. Um, there was a time that we maybe could have worked. I was kind of like, I don't know. I just didn't feel it was, I didn't feel that, if Richie phoned me up tomorrow and said, is injured for a week and you're off, would you help me? Of course I would. But I just right. think our partnership is going... Time and a place. It's time and a place. It's been, it's done, and it's, and it's been, and I can't fault it. And I don't really want to mess it. Like, I, it, we've left it on a high. We're very good friends now. I just think the way we've left it is the, the, the best, and he'll always be a great friend of mine. Do you know what's kind of funny about most people's jobs that caddying's different? And this happens at the amateur level as well. Right? Is that where so, you carry at? Where's that? The amateur level. Of course I do. Oh, right, okay. You know exactly where I don't... I don't... I try, try and be nice. I just wondered. I told just you Because you talk like a pro nice. caddy sometimes, but I just wondered. I just wanted to double check. So. so, listeners, they could be a doctor, they could be a banker, they could work in a restaurant, right? We've got all sorts of different listeners. If they give up their job, they'll go to a different restaurant or they'll go to a different bank. They don't have to see the same boss, right? Whereas, like, even at the resort, there'll maybe be someone that you've carried for five or six years and then either you're bored of them or they're bored of you, and they, but they still come back. And I've had a couple of times where I've bumped into someone and you're like, oh, hello, how's it going? What people need to understand is, if you st- there could be on a tour where maybe eight guys switch caddies, and it's a, it's a Russian roulette type thing, isn't it? 100%. And then you're oh, walking down the range and you were working for him for the last four years and now you're not, and you go, oh, hello, how's it going? Yeah, you, you, from all of a sudden, H- you're how spending... How is that? From all of a sudden, you're, you, you walk by the golfer who you spent day and, all day with right. to the fact that... You, it's, it's I, I, that's a good point because I think about that. I think to myself, I would, that would have been me. But it's like you've got to adapt to the, like you're, you're carrying another player's bag and 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 you're saying hello to your ex boss and he doesn't put the teas in that pocket. He puts the teas in that pocket and you maybe used to go into that chuck us a ball. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm in the wrong pocket because you're so used to going to his pocket. Right. You know things like that. But I think it's. I think we're, the golfers are all set in their own little zones, and I think that helps. Does that make sense? Because uh-huh. they're all concentrating on their own little thing. But as long as you maintain. Maintain friendship, you know. Aye. There's maybe some people that I've maybe burnt bridges with uh, for whatever reason, but maybe that's fate. Maybe that's meant to be. Maybe I have no regrets over that. To Aye. be honest, did you have a job to go to? I didn't have a job when I left Richie. Right. No, I did not have a job to go to. But so I, I, I left Richie with not having a job. There's a lot of caddies out there who always had a job lined up, which is fine. It's understandable, but. That's, that's, what, that's the way it goes so I didn't have a job to go to then what happens you got a reputation now so Craig Connolly who if you don't know and if you don't know him you, most people do know him he talks more than MD but he's a great guy more than you I, I, I talk less than him and I talk more sense than him no actually probably I don't he's a good guy Craig <laughs> a good friend of mine um, Craig's carried for Martin Keimer Paul Casey he's done very extremely well he's got a great nature great personality uh, if you if if you were if, if, if you be if if you were a, if he was a club caddy he'd be the guy you'd want he's just got great well you yourself you both would be brilliant both because right. he's just got story after story story after story but Craig had a great relationship with Paul Casey uh, and I was out of work and I, he hooked me up with that and didn't work for Paul for overly long uh, but it was an opportunity that was amazing thrown in, thrown in the deep end with a big name brilliant that's I've, what I'm all about I've heard he pays double the going rate Mr Casey because he knows that he's a bell end. 
Mr. Casey, no, he's not a bell end. He's oh, right. very hard to work for. Aye. So he needs to you need to get the dollar to make it worthwhile. Uh -huh. But it's not all about the dollar at a certain point. But he, he's not a bad person, Paul, at all. Yeah. Uh, he's been very good to me, very kind to me. But if he phoned me up to work for him, would I work for him again? Probably not, no. But Aye. never say never. Aye. But as it goes, as it goes between me and him, um I respect him. He's he's been good to me and as a golfer, fantastic golfer. One of the best iron players I've ever seen. How much did the player decide who's going to be the next caddy and how much did their entourage, their agent, get involved? I think I think for a younger player coming out to him, let's say a manager company signs a young superstar or meant to be superstar coming through out of college and they've maybe got a buddy guy in the bag. You see a lot of times management company going to a more senior carry to say, you know, you, one one mistake from this young boy, right, we're going to, you know what? Bin him. Bin him. You need this guy. Which I was very, very lucky with Richie. Richie right. never, Richie could maybe have done that. Not saying I made mistakes, but we didn't have a good run. Richie, that was a good time that Richie, and that's what says a lot about Richie Ramsey's character. That could have been me. Uh -huh. I see it happen today. I see it happening very recently. Sometimes as a caddy, if you do get binned as a young person, it's hard at the time, but keep keep going at it. You know what I mean? Well, it, it's, it's rejection. No one reje likes rejection. Nobody likes rejection, no. And but, you... keep, but keep going at it because you know what? Believe in yourself and... You might be that person one day who aye, aye. who gets that job, and that's kind of see myself more at that kind of position now. I've been sacked. I'm going to get sacked again. Who sacked you? Uh, who had Chris Woods sacked me? Big Chris. Big Chris. Chris. Chris Woods, the big, really tall English guy. Yeah, who I worked for for another good run as well. Yeah. How how long do you work? Chris for him? a good guy as well. Two three years. F three and a bit years. How many wins he have? Uh, twice, twice. Twice. Yeah. But he he won the flagship, didn't he? Yeah, we won one in Austria. He kind of ran away with that one, a smaller one. Uh, but he, that was his second win. Uh, and then he won the BMW PJ Wentworth in a Ryder Cup year, which eventually got him into the Ryder Cup. But Chris was another work ethic to me, tremendous. Um, quieter guy, a little bit. Had his own way. He was, you know, he wasn't too caught up in all the biz and all that. And I was a little bit opposite from him. I was a bit more outgoing, maybe a bit in your face a little bit. And he's a bit more. Maybe that's why we worked. But. You could kind of sense things weren't the way they used to be between me and him, for whatever reason. And it was when we defended Wentworth the following year, I got the sack on the Sunday. What is it? How does that happen? I remember coming. I remember we played with Justin Rose on Sunday, and I remember he used to always say we walked off the tee, and I was just like, and he used to always pass me the driver, and I said, "Would he?" Which would just mean he would just give me the driver. I said two or three, two or three times, he just ignored me, and I thought, "What? Oh, what yeah. a prick!" <laughs> 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 and I kind of just was like, but you know what?" That, and he knew what he was doing, and I knew. But I did. And when I seen a frick, I don't mean he's a frick as a person. Right, I mean for that right. moment. Um, but I remember, in the, I remember my wife Amy at the time. She was there that week. It was a really good week. I think obviously it's so times you're defending champion, you get a free room and stuff like that. So it was a good week to bring her. Nice. She flew down. I was already there, uh, and she, so it was after the Sunday, and she was maybe waiting somewhere outside the clubhouse for us to go to get the car. And I think we were going. I think what was going to happen was I was expecting to go to Sweden the following week. Uh, my flight was booked and so me and Amy were going to go to the airport right. um, and I was going to stay at the airport hotel she was going to fly home that night I was flying to Sweden the next day but I came I came out to the I said you don't believe it she says what I've just been sacked she's like <laughs> what you've just been sacked I said I've just been sacked because when she's like no you haven't I said I'm telling you I've just been sacked <laughs> and you know what it felt like a relief. Aye. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And it, I, I think Chris found it extremely hard to tell me. No, I know he did. He told me that. Um, no no airs or graces. Absolutely fine. He's got to do what he's do for best for him. And oh, best for yeah. Me. So yeah. I had a, we had a great run at it. Do, uh, but is it just a kind of, all right, Mark? Uh, Mark the word. I just wanted to let you know this. We're, I'm, this I'm, is the last I'm, week. We're, we're in the finish. Aye, I mean, he can hardly get the words out, but that's fine. Aye. But he didn't have a stutter. He just couldn't, he was finding Aye. it quite emotional, I think. And he's told me that. His friends told me that, his parents and that. And I didn't, I wasn't disheartened by it. Um, it was relief for me. But it's rejection. Aye. And where do you go from no there? rejection. Where do you go from there? So, the all of a sudden, all, no, no, didn't go to the boozer. All of a sudden, I actually had one of the most memorable trips because we've got a car to go back, we've got flights, and, Amy, and I don't have to be anywhere next week. Me and Amy just drove home from Wentworth. Aye. It was brilliant. We had a great time together, and I'll never forget it. And the year before when we won, I'll never forget that either at Wentworth. My dad was there. Uh -huh. The first tour my dad had pretty much came to on his own, and we won. Do you know what I mean? So... Fantastic. You've got to look at you. you instead, of, instead of looking at the small things that you know that might, there's a lot of things that that are like kind of you couldn't dream of happening. Like mm -hmm. back to Lloyd, you know what I mean, like you're rich, you nearly lose his car to go to win, and, and then things like that. My dad being there, first of time, he's ever he's always watched Wentworth for years on TV, loves the flowers, loves the scenery. I want to come, and he was getting the point that it was probably he probably couldn't get around the course now walking, but he could just manage it there, and his son wins. Aye. Do you know what I mean? And then so it's like 
Amazing. So, but you did the Ryder Cup with him? I did the Ryder Cup with Chris. That was your first Ryder Cup then? That was my first Ryder Cup. 2016 it was. It, uh, where was it? Hazel? No. Was it Hazeltine? It was Hazeltine. Right. Mm. Oh, you should know you were there. I was at Hazeltine. Yeah, we were there. It, yeah, uh, Darren Clark was the captain. Um, the team probably... There was a few rookies on the team, Chris being one of them. I think Thomas Peters, uh, Andy Sullivan, Matt Fitzpatrick. I think there was, in relation to the Americans, their rookies were stronger than ours. But there was a there was a point in it on the Saturday, on the afternoon, where Lee Westwood and Danny Willett were one up with two to play. And I think the American players hit first and one of them hit it, missed the green. Their second American player hit and hit the green, but not a great shot. But Danny Willett and Lee Westwood both hit and both missed the green. Where it was, and it wasn't a long hole, it was an eight iron. And I think they lost it to a par. And they probably lost oh, eighteen. Then they lost eighteen. So right. people say that. Like, so that's went from a that's went from a one point to get lost. You've lost two points in a roundabout way. Yeah. So it's, that's a big difference. And I think that put us like three behind on the Sunday, where it would have been one behind. Uh-huh. And the Americans were doing on the back foot then. And I'm not saying we could have won it, but we had a chance. But we played. We didn't play the first day uh, as a rookie, but we played the next morning with Justin Rose against Zach Johnson and um, Jimmy Walker. Comfortable win. You ever hear the story about Jimmy Walker? One second, they'll finish. All Jimmy right. Walker. Uh, All right, okay. Dan and Clark. Boss. Dan and Clark came out onto the sixteenth, and I think, or the fifteenth, and I could remember. I'm saying to Justin Rose, just hold back a bit, as if to say, I want to be word with you before I make the, the announcements for the afternoon parents. And not until later on. Obviously, we still had to finish the game. We won the, the game next hole three and two, whatever it was, and. And I said to Fuchs, who was carrying for Rosie at the time, well, you know, what do you think will happen this afternoon? He says, well, Justin's just told me he wants to play with Chris this afternoon. Don't stop us, just keep us going. Mm-hmm. But we didn't. Darren Clark decided not, which was a bit of a blow. Because uh-huh. after asking Justin, and they both played well, two big English guys, Chris had a lot of respect for Justin. Justin played some of the best golf of his life. And they've just won. So maybe a poor decision, if you ask me. Yeah. I think there's a lot of poor decisions that week, to be honest. Um, uh-huh. But never mind. So... <laughs> so we played one game out of the first four but we've got one point so first Ryder Cup one point out of four well, we'll, we'll, we'll one point out of, out of one we've only played one game so yeah. 100% record Josh Sheik gets made for the Sunday for the, for the um, for the singles probably the guy you didn't win against Dustin Johnson the only person you probably really think to yourself win. you're going to have to play great Chris did play great Chris was six under got beat, up the last, got beat two up I think he was eight under I think Dustin birdied the last so but it was a great Ryder Cup for me even getting beat because you would obviously you want to win it but just being around about that environment, that team environment, gives you, gives you, it's just amazing. And you, you, you do feel nervous, you feel a little bit out of out your, out your comfort zone to a certain extent. But when you get to the stage, you get to another one, you know, that you use all that experience and you wrap it yeah. up and you use that again. You know, you know what I mean? It makes things comfortable. What are the American fans like compared to the European fans? What do you... The American fans, they don't, don't I don't think they give the respect to the game or the or, or the situation as much, but they put on a big show. Aye. A little bit more childish, you know. They, they get drunk on Bud Light, you know what I mean? Like, let's come on here. <laughs> our boys are still our boys are still sober on the old Stella. So so um so you know, they're a little bit they're a little bit soft as it comes to stuff like that, and they're a little bit over the top. It was a bit rowdy in that first year, I think. Aye. I think it got a wee bit it nearly got a wee bit of hatred in it, which Aye. I didn't like. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm not saying that was because of, of of that week. It might have been some another Ryder Cup, but uh, I remember some things getting said to certain golfers, and it might get said in Europe as well. But I don't think it's badly, but it is what it is. Do you think that it's maybe a little out of control, like the treatment of Garcia, for example? I, I always look at it and go, like he he takes it well, but he thrives on it. But to say I mentioned things about his mother, aye. People right close up to you aye, is is, is is do you know what? But then you look. That's, at no, it, that's no banter, is it? But then you look at it and say that Sergio will probably takes that. Do you know what? He's the sad one here, really. As long as you don't want to hear it. But Sergio, don't get me wrong. He'll hate it hearing that. But I tell you something that'll make him grind his yeah, teeth even more. Aye. When he wants to beat those Americans like you do not know, aye. and he's obviously got a great Sergio, a great record in the Ryder Cup. Uh-huh. One of the best golfers ever is lived. Is he not at the top? Point scorer ever? I think he is now. Yeah, yeah. I think two, he is. Sergio's won the most points. It used of all to be time. Faldo, then it was Montgomery, and I think it's yeah. Him, I think right? Sergio too. I think twenty. He's got like twenty seven and a half. Yeah, um, I need to look at that. But yeah, Sergio's Ryder Cup career. But if he could put, if Sergio puts like he doesn't the Ryder Cup, where he'd have won many, many majors. Right. But so I think he's doing all right. He's um, Jimmy Walker. I think he won the PGA Championship. He won the PGA, uh, and in, then in, he, then he I mean, was that that one. Did well, and then he then he get uh, a tick bite, and he's got Lyme's disease. Does he? And that's why you don't see him anymore. He just disappeared off the face of the I've seen him last week on the range and I thought to myself, he, I was working for Alex and I actually said, Alex, 
how good is he striking the balls? Because I, I remember him being a great ball oh, striker. I remember his putting always being hot or cold. But T.T. Green, a beautiful ball striker. Brilliant. But, but you you're see, right, I hadn't seen him for a few he, years. He got really ill, and then the big thing about Limes is energy levels are really low. And he's quite so a slim person as so it is. Aye, it's really tough for him to get four rounds yeah, under his belt. Maybe, yeah, exactly. So, so, and a practice round as well, you know, especially when you're playing the heat. But. That's something people should be aware of in the thick grass or the, the ticks, the certain tick that gives you limes. You're not talking about the Celtic here, you know, just so you know. Because <laughs> I don't talk about them, I talk about the Glasgow Rangers, who are the, the be-all and end-all oh, when it comes to Scottish football. We are the people, you we, call we it. We are the people, don't forget it. I've been sitting here with my beautiful Rangers uh, training top on, so I'm, I'm just going to kiss the badge. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Embarrassing. How, 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 how did okay, you get during the week? Yeah, that's in the past, can't, I can't remember. <laughs> I, don't, I told you I've not got a good memory, Gordon. Uh, so you go, Chris Wood, you get sacked. How did you end up getting the next job? Next. I don't know how I worked for I got that job. Where did I work for next? I worked for Tyrrell, I think. Worked for Tyrrell. Tyrell Hatton. Tyrrell Hatton. What a Mr. Talky Talky. Tyrrell at that point was, he was, yeah, I worked for Tyrrell Hatton because my friend Chris Rice was carrying for him and he split up him. Um, and really, I went into a job that I thought to myself, how could they never carry for this guy? But <laughs> thinking about the dollar. Right. Um, I think somebody else worked in between the two of us. Uh, yeah, Tyrrell was good to me. I maybe left Tyrrell in a, in, a, in a position that I maybe jumped the gun. That's maybe, if any regret, I probably maybe slightly regret that there. Maybe I didn't see the big picture too much and I was maybe letting little things annoy me. I maybe was not myself within. There was maybe a few things going on and, and maybe that was like that was kind of making things worse than what they were, actually were right. where I could just have been able to if I was a bit more mature now I just accept them and, and let it be water off a duck's back where I was trying to, I was letting things irritate me for no reason um, but Tyrrell was nothing but good to me as a golfer for tremendous MD asked me what's Tyrrell's he's a he's a he's a he's a eight and a half nine out of ten at everything mm-hmm. chipping phenomenal putting phenomenal iron play phenomenal woods driving why, phenom- why is he not won anything really really like the the, one of the top fours of he's, he's done okay majors I think his major career record should have been better he's won Aldo Palmer in America I think he'll win more in America he's game, I think since he came to America he's really suited Tyrrell's work it I love the way see it's, it's, it's different for everybody Tyrrell this is what I like about Tyrrell he's a golfer he's not a range golfer he hates, doesn't like the range mm-hmm. when he was younger he would warm up and just play golf mm-hmm. so he's very aggressive he knows how to score not once did I work for Tyrrell Hatton, and after the round would we ever do any practice. Not once. Not once. Never. Never. He would. You would meet him. You would stand outside where he gets his scorecard. He would. You would put his watch on, get his phone, his wallet, and you'd go straight to the locker. You'd go to the locker just before him. You'd have his shoes sitting out, and he would just take his shoes off, and he'd see you tomorrow. That's the way he's seen it. Mm-hmm. And I think the way he's seen it was that because he could accept what the day was. If he's swinging good, why upset it? If he's swinging bad, why make it worse? Mm-hmm. Accept it for what it is. And I think that's why he's very good. People see him lose the head over things. To, to me, it's a little bit of... He feels embarrassed with certain shots he hits. Uh, and it's his way of deflecting it. But people say, oh, he needs to calm down on that. Well, I'll tell you something that's working for him. Mm-hmm. If he changes that, it won't work for him. Yeah. And he has mellowed. He's a very good person. He's a good guy, a good heart. And he'll go on to play more Ryder Cups. And I think he can win a major. Uh-huh. Out doubtly he can win it. He's got when it comes down the stretch, he knows how to get over the line, and I hope he does. Who did you work for that used to go to the range all the time? Alex Norton lives on the range. Oh yeah, yeah. But that works for Alex. He's always done that. Uh-huh. But he's not as bad as he used to. As me as a caddy, like I've said to Alex, you know, be only back for a few weeks. Like Alex, right, right, that's the last bucket. Because I'm not saying that because I'm lazy. I'm saying that, Alex because you're swinging good. Because he doesn't, he's not in control. He, he's, he thinks he's back at the Bears Club and he's hitting balls all day every day. That's all right when you're at home. This is a tournament. Uh-huh. And we're going to do a bit of putting. Yeah. yeah. You can speak to Alex like that, and he respects you for that. I'm not, not, I'm not like I don't want to be there. I'm like Alex, you, you're, you, you don't need to do this. You're in a good place. And sometimes you'll say, "No, I want one more." That's fine, but he might not even hit them. He might only hit ten of them because you just want to try and get a little. Alex is the kind of guy who likes to leave with a feeling. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And Tyrrell went for the feeling was he wanted to put shoes on and go. That was his feeling. Right. So it's all different, and well, I respect both of them because. They both they both do their own thing and it works for them and I think there's a lot to be said for that. Don't let people interfere too much and take you off the track that's got you where you where, where it has got you. Mm-hmm. Any other good players you work for? Uh, I worked for a French kid guy there during the summer for a few weeks, Antoine Rosner uh, from Paris. Very very good. I think he could be a name. I think he could play Ryder Cup one day. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah, else have I worked for? Adrian Nos, a Spanish kid. I've done a few weeks with him. Kim Flamboyant, big, big, long hitting a Spanish uh, player. Yeah, he's got talent. I'd say he's another Ryder Cup potential player. Um, yeah, I've not really worked for a lot of golfers, uh-huh. but as in, I've done the odd week, but I don't really classify that as a, you know, you're just you're filling in. What's the longest period you've gone missing cuts? Three cuts in a row. Three in a row. Three in a row. That's not too bad, is it? Very lucky. That's very lucky, because I know 
I've seen carries miss. I've seen carries say they made one cut in twenty events. And you know what that is? It means nothing to do with the carry. Oh, nothing to do with the carry. It's all we rely on our golfers' talents. Right. Toe went. Good friend of mine, you know him very well, Clark. Mm. I think he worked Phenomenal for guy. Ross Drummond or Crut. Who, which one won the PGA at Wentworth? Scott or Ross? Scott Drummond. Scott Drummond. Yeah, he worked then, for him for a long time. And he then he missed like 27 or 28 in a that's row. That's right, the year after. That's, that's, that's how I met Toe when he was first on tour. He's came for Scott Aye. Drummond. Scott's a nice guy. It's a long, long... Uh, those are long weeks. I'll be honest, I take my hat off to those guys. Aye. Uh, and I've been very, very fortunate. I don't mean that to be big headed because it's not... I, and I'll be the first to say I'm, I have been very lucky. Uh, but that there says a lot about somebody. So your players have won how many times now? Is it you, you get six? No, I think I've won four, four, I think. Four? Is that all? Wait, wait, I think. Rich, two with Richie and two with Chris, that's it. Yeah. Well, Tyrrell Hatton never won with you in the back? I never won with Tyrrell Hatton. We should have won the Dunhill. I gave him the wrong club in one hole, which could have been the fault. But no, never. F- I, had, I thought I had five, but no. We'll, t- we'll, put, we'll put the Ryder Cup 2018 as the one. That was the, the highlight of my career as a... That was it. That was, the, that was the pinnacle for me, as in the whole thing. Yeah. That was... Out of this world. I, I enjoyed that Ryder Cup more because I'd been to one before. When did you start watching the Ryder Cup? I watched Ryder Cup when I was when I was not really into golf. I oh, think right. it's one of the sports that, that a lot of people can watch because it's it happens every two years. It's you know between Europe and America, and I think it's the whole feel of you know the way they play the format and catches people. I think non golfers get it. I was more into it when I was younger than I am now. I have virtually no interest now. But back in say, I remember eighty nine. That's because you moved to America. You don't know who you're side you're on now. Well, I don't see myself as European, Mark. So there you go. You don't dress you like a European. <laughs> Absolutely, do. I look like a. I dress like a tramp. What are you talking about? Uh, well, I'm in the gutter too, so I'll see you there. <laughs> True. Mm-hmm. Right. So tell us why 2018 was so special then. Paris National Golf Course. You've been there. I've been there. Yeah. What, Crack, a what a finishing! What? Mem- remember the first time we went there? What a golf course! And we're saying, you know what? This because we knew oh, in ten years or something they're getting the, yeah. the Ryder Cup, and those last four holes. Just this natural amphitheatre and thinking, oh, this... It's, it's, it's what we call it as a stadium course, which you get yes. in America, like your TP yeah. sawgrass and stuff like that. It's a bit of a stadium course, apart from, the, as Gordon says, there's holes near the water, but they're kind of... The, the surround the, on the outskirts you can have everything round about it the golf course is one of the best golf courses I've ever carried on it's I for, very forgettable after about the 4th to the 12th I thought well that's I can't from, remember you've got a good memory when it comes to everyone else I know that golf course like the back of my hand ah, okay. because good that's all I'm good at remembering uh, but the golf course we set up that week phenomenal absolutely phenomenal uh, the, ter- the fairways were quite tight as in they, weren't na- they were quite narrow first cut was reasonable second cut was okay the third cut was horrendous Death. But that helped the Europeans. So it did. They set it up well for Europeans. That was the best team America had in paper of all time. Mm-hmm. And Europe blew them away. I remember standing on the 18th tee on the first... On the, on the, we didn't play the first morning. We played, we played every game after that. We played... Tyrrell played the game every after that. I remember sitting on the... Or did we play the first morning? I can't remember. I think we might have. We played with Paul Casey. Tyrrell and Paul. Two, they were the only two people that would probably be best to play with one another. Both get similar games. Both English. Both very good at golf. But I remember being on the 18th tee and we were one down, I think it was. No, no, we were all square. We were all square playing Justin Thomas and uh, Jordan Spieth. Yeah. And they hit first. Spieth kind of carved it a little bit right into the rough. Justin Thomas hit it down the the right. No, he hit it it down the right over the bunker. Long carry, like 310, 315. If you slightly pull it, Mm -hmm. Water. Water. But he could have easily, after you've seen what Jordan did, he could easily just hit a freeway down the kind of left centre or down the left, it's hard to describe, but just down the middle in a way. But he's kind of taken over the, the long part and he's at, when he's going in with wedge or nine iron and the pins back right, just when you're coming across, when you're trying to come onto the green, there's a little walkway and when it's sitting there, place it, they don't usually use it for the French Open, but a great, great match play pin. So our partner, Mr. Paul Casey, stands up and he carves it and him and Justin Thomas, and, uh, sorry, him and uh, Jordan Spieth are you know, close to one another in the rough, they can't get to the green. So Tyrrell has to strap a pair on, straight down the middle. And I remember talking to Tyrrell when we get there, I said, I remember getting there just before him, I'm thinking to myself, I'm trying to work out my head, the pins on, oh, just give us a perfect number, like a, a perfect club so we can just hit it. And we had the perfect number. It was cold, it wasn't overly warm at that point, it was in, and it was the ball, it was playing long, but a bit into it, it was right. And I thought, that's good, right hand pin into it, right, perfect for Tyrrell. It's off the tee, it's good because he can hold it a little bit, and the second shot. And I think to myself, come on, be the good number. And it was like, normally it would have been between four and five, He's, the adrenaline's pumping so you know it's a good number it's, an easy, it's a five all day all right. anyway I said to Tyrrell like you know we know Jordan, uh, Justin Thomas who's got nine iron probably max maybe even a wedge which is really could make it it's a good birdie chance from where he is yep. uh, on the angle I was like to Tyrrell like, what do you think here you know between the pin and that let's make us Tyrrell just says to me I'm going right at it mm-hmm. I just stepped away and he had this shot in mid-air I thought to myself this is stiff 
and it landed about four on the green, and there's a, a wee upslope, and it just hit it, and it it was it was, it was like you could never hit that if it yeah. if it landed one more yard, it would have probably been within four or five feet, right. and we we're thinking this must be stiff when he's hit the shot I've ever seen, the best shot I've ever seen him hit, but. Get off. So the Justin Thomas hits it on, actually doesn't hit it as close as Tyrrell. Tyrrell's a putt to win, doesn't hold it, fights for half. But it was amazing feeling being being there uh -huh. and that uh -huh. coming down the stretch, just thinking to yourself. That was that was as a caddy, it was probably the most pressure I've had on myself as a caddy. What was the, the celebrations like? How they long Can't remember. Last? Can't remember them. They were amazing. Two amazing. days. No, we, we stayed there the night and then the next day you fly home. Um, my wife Amy at the time, she was there um, and it was brilliant with a great, great celebration, you know what I mean? It was so one of those ones that goes in far too quick. Right. Um, but it was brilliant. Just just to be in a room with, you know, all the, the top European players, you know what I mean? And, and and it's like a relief nearly. And you've done it for you know, it's it, you can see it means so much to people, do you know what I mean? I it was just a great night. You know what I mean and you'll never you can't buy those memories and it's a bond that you'll always have with people, do you know what I mean? So I great. You ever I probably Took things like that and didn't for granted a little bit. Didn't respect them as much. Not not respect them like didn't appreciate them as much. Is that be the word to use? And I do look back now and say I could have enjoyed that a bit. Not say I didn't enjoy it myself, but I should have been a little bit more in the moment. Something I struggle with. So if I stay in the moment uh, more, you, you and me both. Yeah, stay in the moment is a lot, is is a good place for me in life right now. Uh huh. Now something that happened to me a few weeks ago. I'm carrying for a pro. We're doing really well. Leading. You kind of get carried away. Of course. What event was that? Sorry, I was just drinking the, my Coke Zero there. What event was that? The Pure, the Pure Insurance at Pebble. Talk about the Pure Insurance, tell me a bit more about it. Well, it's just a, it's a senior tour event, it's okay. a pro-am. Brilliant. And we start leaking oil both days on the, on the Saturday and the Sunday. Okay. The last five holes, yep. we're four over both days. Yeah, you're coming down the stretch a little bit. Now, once on the Sunday, the cloud comes in here at Pebble, which it's depressing. My guy's... Kind of over it. Temperature drops probably a little the bit. Temperatures drop. Yeah, yeah. And I know there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can say or do right now. And it's I just felt so lonely. Yeah. And an, un an uncomfortable feeling. Oh, horrendous. Yeah, yeah. Oh, horrendous. Yeah, and, yeah. and you don't even know. You don't even want to open your mouth to say anything because it's like nothing's going to help. I'll you. be a first. <laughs> the, you've been there before, like just players leaking or, or, or like what do you think it is I, th I feel as if experience depends is... on what player you've got because some players you can't say anything to it can make it worse aye but these are, these are, this is a conversation I would probably have with a player and say now that you've got the experience from if you were to work for the gentleman again what would you want me to do in that situation he might aye. say to me just you did nothing wrong you might think you've done wrong you probably might he might turn around and say no I thought you did, you did great so you don't know mm -hmm. so you need to some players you, you would if you said to them, right, come on, keep the chin up, like, you know what, just keep fighting or whatever, it's just one shot at a time. So, oh, shut up, don't keep saying that one shot at a time thing. Like, So you've got to be careful what some people can like. Mm -hmm. But I think you've got to try and always get in front of the player, walk and be quicker, get up, beat, don't be slugging behind. Don't Because I think that's your body... Mm -hmm. your, body your, language. Body language change, yeah. You know what I mean? Give him, put your arm around him. I've said to Alex before, like, you know what, come on. Or our golf before, put your arm around him. Like, good, yeah, good putt. You've got to be patient. They will come. Come on, chin up. Let's go. Come on, let's do this. Aye. I'm Aye. talking after four or five holes a Monday on a Thursday morning. Aye. Aye. Because, now, but that can be that little bit. You're not. You're you're, you're there. To, you're you don't want them to do bad. You know. You're, oh, no, no, no. You're, I remember. You're, you've got their best interest. I remember but, saying that to somebody. Aye. Caring for someone in British Open qualify. I get the number wrong. Aye. Right. The wrong Aye. bush. Aye. The wrong bush. Aye. And he puts it. And, and he's and he's chewed me out. And I says, listen. I'm here for you. Like if you do well, I do well. Aye, yeah, I'm in your team. Yeah, exactly. I just made a mistake. Yeah, exactly. You always make you, hey, you ever, mistakes happen with human. I always find the book very complicated. So many numbers, so many things. But, but that's where, as a caddy, I'll highlight things in my books, like numbers. Like I know roughly on a whole we're going to hit it. Alex hits driver. So I'll highlight maybe a, a say, say it's Alex plays meters. I'll say I'll put a line between say two seventy and three hundred meters, right? Mm -hmm. And I know roughly we're going to be in that area. Or take or, or when you're walking to the ball, look at the things like that bunker's there, so it's one forty from that bunker. So the sprinkler just short right of that is maybe one forty. So you try and calc there is a lot of numbers in the book, and I totally agree with you. Especially in America because it's all sprinkler heads. In Europe it's different. The guy who makes the books puts dots, dots and dashes on the sides, which is a lot easier. But you're right, it is harder, but you've got to try and make it as easy as possible. You know why? Under the pressure, it makes right. it easy. So that's why you've got to do that. Use the bunkers and stuff like that. So that's why I kind of make little areas like that. So I know to myself, right, Alex hits his driver 285 on average. So it depends on, and from there it's roughly 150. I know roughly we'll have 160. I know by the time we get the ball, between what it's between two clubs. Mm -hmm. So you get, you're get always ahead of the game. And also when you're standing on the green, when your boy's putting or somebody else putting out or he's already finished and there's two guys to putt, I'm on the next page, mate. Aye. I'm on the next page. Well, Alex, the wind's 
on the clock dial, as I call it. So 12 o'clock straight in, 6 o'clock straight behind, 3 o'clock st- straight off the right, 9 o'clock straight off the left. Mm-hmm. So I'll be there, like Alex, it's uh, I like driver here today, wins at 10 o'clock. Mm-hmm. You've already, you tell him, before. You, he doesn't ask oh, you, aye. you just tell him. Tell. And that's it, that gives him so much, you know, it makes him be able to commit a lot better. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no humming in hand. I see a lot of humming in hand between players. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it can't be that hard. No. That's because they're both a little bit unsure. Where one of you have got to take control. Alex doesn't carry a book, which is all relies on me. Mm-hmm. But I like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what you're there for. Yeah, that's what uh, he pays me for. You ever carry for a pro who got a hole in one in a tournament? Yes, I have. How many? One. Chris Wood. But if you ever wanted to do one, it was at Wentworth and he won an IE. Ten grand, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you ever had a hole in one? I don't, I've, never done, I've never had a whole one oh, play myself. No, so. no. Do you? So Zabo, that usually does the the podcast with me, he got one at the hay. All oh, right, the par three course uh, there at Pebble doesn't count, does it? Or does it? Forty six, forty six yards. Go on, it's course it counts. If it's a par three and he made, a, and he hit, when the ball went in the hole first, one on shot a, is on a, a par three course. But you, 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 you then quantify that as the same as Chris Woods. Hundred percent. It's not. It's not his fault. It's forty three yards. Is that just because I disagree with it that you're disagreeing with me? No, no, he's that's a whole one. I think I know you. Oh, way with you. Well, course, you're you're one of the only ones. It's a whole one. That. If he's playing a golf course, it's got. It's not his fault. It's his par three course. It's a whole one. A whole one. He plays it every day. But it doesn't matter if it's a hundred yards or two hundred yards. It's I still can, a whole one. I can spit further than forty three yards. Yeah, but how many whole ones you had around here? Two. Have you? I don't count them. Ah, okay. But nobody's really interested in your whole ones. <laughs> well, you're not. Right, next subject. Uh, <laughs> what adv- if you could have two pieces of advice for any amateur golfer? What would they be? Don't be trying to be the best guy in the range with the best golf swing and be the best ball striker. Put a scorecard in your pocket and make a score. It's all about scoring. Okay. Doesn't matter how you do it. Does not it's matter not how you do how, it. It's how many. Hundred percent. And and also what I would say a little bit is people have got weaknesses, right? And a lot of players will avoid the weaknesses. But see if you're a weak. Say say you're a ten out. Of, say you're a ten out of ten putter. Or say a nine out of ten putter, and you're a seven out of ten driver. To get to a seven and a half out of drive out of driver, you don't have to do as much work as you think. You're probably never going to get to nine, but concentrate on your strengths as well, and just mm-hmm. take away at the weaknesses because you don't want to deflect what got you there in the first place. Mm-hmm. A lot of guys have put too much effort and energy into their small their weakness, which sometimes a weakness is a weakness, and, and it can only improve slightly. Does that make sense? You just don't want it to become weaker, mm-hmm. but it can become weaker if you take your attention span from what you makes you good. So say your short game, you take a little bit of time from that away and put it into something that's... And you, you're cross between the two. You, you know, this might not have improved much and you're losing what you were really good at. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Who's the best, best uh, pro you've ever seen play the game? Rory McIlroy. McIlroy, on his day, the best. The best. Yeah. As an all-round, he plays his A-game, nobody will beat him. And I mean that. Nobody, nobody will touch him. Uh-huh. He knows that. Everybody, we all know that. One player I would say, though, Dustin Johnson is very, very close. Doesn't get the credit he's due. They all say he hits it far. Dustin Johnson hits it far, don't get me wrong, and he hits it so damn straight. Aye. What uh, about your favourite favourite player in history? you have ever have a favourite player? Um, favourite golfer forever. When I was growing up, I really liked Sergio. Mm-hmm. The way he was young and flamboyant, and he came on the scene and took the world on. Um, yeah, I still think... I still respect Sergio a lot and, and, and I like the way he plays the game but if I was to go and watch if I was to play around the golf with somebody Aye. for one time only I'd have to play with Tiger Tiger okay and if you had because a- I've played with Roy maybe I'd have a chance of beating him <laughs> 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 no I've been out with Tiger uh, which is, is obviously was amazing um, as I said there's an all round goal for Rory in my Tiger's got a don't get me wrong I'm not trying to compare the two here but they're both different in their own ways uh-huh. but Tiger's ball striking the way he hits the golf ball is better than MD, I think. Right. But the way the Rory drives the ball and, and the way he hits shots, you know, the, is, is as an all rounder, like is unbelievable. But don't uh-huh. get me wrong, they're not they're both different in their ways. But um, yeah, if I was to have a if I was to have a four ball, it would be with me, Rory McIlroy. Me, me. Let me think. Definitely not. You could carry. It. Be Rory McIlroy, Tiger Woods, and George Best. George Best. That okay. would be a good four ball. Favorite tournament on the schedule, either European or PGA Tour. Wentworth in Europe. Wentworth. Yep. Okay. Not uh, not not Cransur? No, I'm not a big fan. No, not a big fan of that week. No, that's okay. a ski slope. Yeah, yeah, yeah but the, the 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 way the the, the carries are treated or the, the nah the, 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 Wentworth, Wentworth. Okay, Wentworth. Wentworth. Okay. Okay. Scottish Open is obviously great as well. Uh, we we looked after there, but Wentworth's the one. And America, the Masters is special. Aye. Outside, but then that's a major. But outside of a major, what tournament? I like Hilton Head's a really nice tournament. Hilton, Head. Hilton Head's got a nice feel about it. I, I like the Hilton Head event. I'd always look forward to it. How many times have you been to Augusta? Uh, three. Yeah, yeah. Once, you went once. Well, once, what, once what for you, me. Well, Jack Johnson one. We'll never forget it. <laughs> That's right. That was a good. Yeah, but hopefully, hopefully be there. Hopefully be there next year. Yeah. And obviously, in two thousand and twenty-three. 
Right. What's your, what's a successful year for you then this year going forward? With Alex, I would say you're obviously trying to win. Right. Yeah. If you get you know on the PGA Tour, if you get a win per season, you're you mean, oh. when it's massive. It's the caliber out here. The strength and the depth, the quality is incredible. But I think a goal for us would be to get in contention for a win and hopefully knock it off. Hopefully, Alex. I think he's 50th in the world right now. So getting at top 50 by the end of Christmas means you're pretty much secured all four majors for next year. Putting points on the board for the Ryder Cup. Aye. So 2023, the Ryder Cup's in Italy. Okay. That would be, if Alex is still employing me by then, that would be my third Ryder Cup with three different players. And I think that's quite unique. I don't think many people could say they've done that. Billy Foster. Billy Foster's done it with Matt Fitzpatrick, Five. Westwood, Seve. Yeah. Faldo. Faldo. I know he never worked for Faldo. Never worked for Faldo. He's, but he's probably done four, three or four. I only task. But mean, Billy's carried in, like, I think 20. No, not 20. I think he's about 10 or 12. How many majors you carried in? Oh, probably over 50. 50. And no, 40, 40 to 50. 40 to 50. Who's the best caddy you've ever worked with? Is there anyone that you... Because in my whole time of caddying, almost 30 years, there's a couple of people I remember. But and I there's, a, there's a couple of caddies for me. Depends what you're looking for. If I was a player, would... Yeah, because or have you ever learnt off someone and said, oh, I like the way he talks, he likes the way he says that? Yeah, there's a guy called Guy Tilson, who's one of the twins back in the UK. Big, tall, blonde hair boy. He worked for Simon Dines for a long time. He actually just worked for Richard Rams recently in one. Guy Tilson is a caddy who's... Extremely experienced, came from a, a golf club background, like a club caddy, the same as me. And he kind of keeps himself away from everybody. He doesn't need praise. He's not. He's not. Doesn't blow his own trumpet. He's probably. I don't think he's ever carried a red cup though. I don't think he's ever won for a major champion. But he's a very, very, very good caddy. The way he explains it, he's calm and confident. Uh, he does his research, which makes you calm and confident. Chris Rice, who's working for Harold Varner just now, who used to work for David Horshey, the amateur stuff. Me and him in the same path. He's a very, very good caddy. A very good caddy. For somebody to come out with me same time as me, I would I would say he's an extremely good caddy. Is he a better caddy than me? He might well be. But we'll just say we're fifty fifty. But he's a he's a he's a great guy, great caddy as well. Yeah, there's a few caddies. I think you're always learning learning little things. Oh, every, every every day's a school day. Every day's a school day. Less is more. But it all depends on the player. Like being like say I was a tour player and I knew what I knew just like the way I am just now, and I'm quite O C D kind of furrow. I would I wouldn't really rely on my caddy too much. I'd rather have my caddy was had my back, right. had my trust, and it was a laugh. Do you know what I mean? Good luck. And that, but that's why a lot of cat players nowadays, and I'm not... And, they have and their mates. Have their mates, because you think about it. For example, you know, you've got Ian Finnis, guys for Tommy, you've got Dustin with his brother, you've got Phil with his brother, you've got Rory with uh, his great friend uh, Harry. These guys, they are on your side. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong, every guy's on the side, but they have you got trust you. Them. But also, when the players get to that calibre of, of level of, of quite a superstar, you know that the guys are not going to send to MD. They're not looking to try and get another bag. They're not trying. To, they're not going to get drunk in a bar and say something. They might, you know, they've got, and, and that's a lot to do with it now. And people think, oh, why they take these mates? But that's why the, we are just a small part of the wheel. These guys, I believe, that if they all push trolleys, that the world rankings would still be the same. Give or take a little bit. We are just a small part of the wheel. And if we can be 10% of the wheel, that's great, because that's what we get paid. Mm-hmm. So for me, if I could come in, Alex, I would say around Alex maybe thinks... Some days he'll not. He, some days he's right with every decision as in what club was in, and we're both the same. Say over a tournament of four days, there might be two times he's in doubt. In doubt, there was one last week he wanted to hit six on a par three, uh, number eight on the the, the TP Summerlin. He's only wanted to hit six because he's seen the one the other guys hit a six, Aye. and he's come up short. And I think myself, play your own game, mate. He, well, that's what we had. It was a seven all day Aye. before, and I was thinking to myself, I'm just going to cut it to right pin. I said Alex, he was just about to what he was getting. The, it was his shot, so he was putting get his grip on that. And he's about to get to us. I said, Alex, why are you hitting this six? You can get it's a perfect seven. You, th- you sure? Yes. Put the six away, it's a seven. Stiffs it. Right? No. But that wasn't me being big and cocky. I'm like, no. I think myself, if he hits six, it, it's long. It's, well, it's a harder shot because see the pin we were at? You only wanted to be, you didn't have to get it all the way back there. And it was you wanted to play the fat part of the green, we just left it, it was a shot. He actually pushed it a little bit and it hit the slope and came round. But if he hit six, he'd had to take a lot off of it. And if he missed it right, it was dead. And if he hits it straight, and holds on to it too long. It was in the back bunker, which was good. So it was, it was six was never the club. Uh-huh. But Alex is the first person to say, "Great club, what a caddy." Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But that's, but that's what it's all about. As long as one of it gets it right. So nine, nine times out of ten, he's right. He knows. If I'm going to be there that other time, and that could be the difference. Mm-hmm. These guys know what they're doing. When you go on the track, I'll go onto the onto the range with Alex, and we'll have the quad pro. So I'll say, Alex, pitch at seventy five, pitch at one hundred two, pitch at one hundred three. A lot of times he's within two all the time. Because yeah. obviously the, he hits the ball and the data goes back, the system tells you where you've pitched it. So he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Like if I say Alex hit a, hit a 167 meter seven iron, he can get it within, he might hit it right on the button. Aye. He knows his game that well. True. I and so they should. It's our trade. It's, it's, it's our job. Yeah, they do it day in, day out. Do you do any of the social media marketing? I'm on Instagram Aye. and I'm on Twitter. 
or Twitter, whatever you call it, and I'm on Facebook. What's your handle? I'll tell you right now. I'll just stick to the Instagram, guys. Um, uh, my handle is Mark, M A R K, all lowercase, underscore C R A N E 82. So it's Mark underscore Crane 82, all lowercase. There we go. Perfect. So you I'll repeat that one more time because yeah. I need some followers. M A R K <laughs> underscore Crane, which is C R A N E 82. Just Look like, forward to you guys following me and I'll follow you back. Like Ben Crane. Uh, perfect. Well, listen, thank you very much uh, for Pleasure, joining Bob. us. Uh, we'll see you maybe later in the year. And we'll no, get... no, no problem at all. I look forward to that. Maybe something at the Waste Management would be a good one to catch oh, up. Oh, there you go. Waste Management, AT&T, something like that. Yep. Early probably. next year. Uh, safe journey on. Where are you off to next? South Carolina? CJ Cup, South Carolina. There's a course called Congaree, I think. I think it's just about 40 minutes south or of a town called Beaufort, okay. where I used to actually carry when I was younger. You've been uh, there as well, Gordon. Uh, uh, so I'm looking forward to going down that direction. Uh, it's a, it's like a, it's a no-cut tournament. I think it's a 78-man field, so should be good. Perfect. Well, this, this episode will probably come out after that event anyway, so... Uh, everyone will know well, you'll get check. You've done. Yeah, hopefully my check will clear by then Aye, big fat check perfect well listen thank you very much for your time uh, for all the listeners out there uh, if you're new check out the previous episodes there's over 100 now and also if you have any comments questions feedback email me podcast at glorifieddonkey.com or you can follow on all of the social media uh, at glorified donkey but uh, many, t- many thanks for your help get out there enjoy your golf but more important Keep it humble.